I'm Jennifer Schaffner with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, and we are thrilled and honored to be here with the partnership and to wish the Bionicki a happy 50th birthday. Uh, it occurred to me early on this week that I am older than the Bionicki. <laughs> and I am very pleased to report that more than half of the participants, both here and online, are not older than the Bionicki, which is the right way. Today, we're actually getting down to focus on the stakeholders. A couple of phrases have been ringing in my ears already. We're custodians, not owners. And another one from the pre-meeting workshop, we connect people with collections in exhilarating and compelling ways. So today we have, like uh, yesterday, three presentations and we'll have uh, some commentary. The first speaker today is Liz Chapman. She's um, at the London School of Economics and she's the director there of the library. We have Kevin, who's a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And Catherine Regan, who is an assistant director and a curator in Cornell's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Good morning, everybody. Um, really good to be here. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to stand back a little from a project that I am living day to day. 24-7. So I'm going to present a case study, as far as we have a case study so far, of the move of the Women's Library to LSE. I was tempted to call this talk when at least half your, your population are your stakeholders. But honestly, we found that more than half the population are our stakeholders, and you will get to see why. The Women's Library is not a donation to LSE. It's not a solicited deposit. It's not a deposit. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. On the left here, you can see the building that is the Women's Library now. Um, and the collection inside it is now owned by LSE. The building was refurbished from an old wash house, hence my title, Wash House to Workhouse. And below the wash house picture is a picture of the reading room of the Women's Library. On the right is the LSE Library, outside view, nighttime, um, and inside view, daytime. Rather different buildings, although on our site there was previously a workhouse. I wanted to write in our bid from wash house to workhouse, but I wasn't allowed to. So, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Women's Library and why it is that we were so interested in taking on this collection. It's the oldest and most extensive collection of women's history in Europe. It's a key part of our national heritage. It was founded effectively in 1926, but actually by the suffragettes. And just by word of explanation, in the UK, they were called suffragettes. The newspapers derided them and called them suffragettes, and they took that up as part of their cause. I know that in the US, you call similar women suffragists. We call them suffragettes, so don't feel it's an insult. It was an insult, and they took it right on the chin. <laughs> So, founded in 1926 as the Library of the London Society for Women's Service, which was a non-militant organisation led by the leading suffragette, Millicent Fawcett. But it's become Europe's leading source of documents relating to every aspect of women's lives. So it's unique, internationally renowned, it holds UNESCO-recognised documents, particularly in the area of suffrage, and the collection is recognised for its rare and historic materials. To give you an idea of the size, though you know size isn't everything, it developed from the suffrage movement and includes 60,000 books and pamphlets, 3,500 serials and press cuttings, and in addition, and these are the most critical materials to us, 500 personal and organisational archives and over 5,000 objects, such as posters, photographs, badges, banners, clothing, as you will see later. And what about the LSE? Well, LSE, whose formal title for the library is the British Library of Political and Economic Science, you can tell why I don't use that in my title, was founded in 1896. It opened one year after the school was founded. And the school was founded by four Fabians. Um, and we'll talk a little more about one of those later. The library is open to the public. 
Uh, it covers the whole range of social sciences. Um, and it has, as you can see, rather exciting architecture. It's now 11 years old, but it's wearing well. It's very busy because it's open to the public, uh, which is relatively unusual for a university library in the UK. Um, and it's one of five nationally funded research libraries. We have terrific archives on campaigns, social surveys from the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries. Gay liberation began at the LSE in the UK and we have all their documentation. And our collections are designated as nationally important. So you can see for us to bring these two things together seemed to us a very good thing to do. In March 2012, London Metropolitan University, who were the owners of the Women's Library, decided they could no longer support the collection and they looked for a new owner. Um, my archivist talked to me about it and I said, what do you think? And she said, I think it'd be great. And I said, I think it's beyond great. We should do this. Now, to those of you who are archivists and think that your director is a waste of time, this is the job that I had to do. I had to do the politics, right? This is the job that I needed to do. I needed all the support of my archives and specialist staff, but I needed to do the politics, and uh, they had to happen pretty quickly. So we had to build a case inside the school to start with. Uh, obviously, I had to bring library staff with me, and I talked to library staff a lot about it. We had to build slowly, so I began by writing to academic staff I knew would support me. And I got 100% support. Do it. Get it. Why haven't we had it before? Bring it here. In fact, it was offered to LSE in the 1970s, but that's a different question. <laughs> I spoke to the Students' Union. Uh, the president of the Students' Union at the moment is a woman. She was very keen. She said, I'll support you. That will be good. I have to say that later, once the building works began, the student newspaper said, why are LSE spending £3 million on the Women's Library? This was a lie, but don't let's go there. Um, so, then I ran into the head of estates, uh, that's buildings, facilities, whatever you might like to call it, on your campus. And he said, how are you, Liz? And I said, I'm fine, Julian. I'm trying to make a bid for the Women's Library. Women's Library, he said, I've read about that. You want it, don't you? Shall I employ an architect for you? <laughs> what a guy. So he did. Um, finance were a little more wary, just a tad more wary. This was not a free gift we were taking on. Uh, their severe reply was, build a business case. I had the feeling that in brackets uh, it was, she'll never get a, building case together, a business case together. But we did. Um, and the other people we had to talk to were human resources, because there's existing staff in the Women's Library who were to transfer with the collection. Okay. I was very lucky that the day I heard about this was my once-a-term appearance at the director's management team. And although I have an agenda I have to go with, I had to split off from the agenda and apologise and say, look, there's something I'm really passionate about here. I need to talk to you about this. It's not usually good to shock these people. They don't necessarily like surprises, but I think they understood what I was talking about. And that's where the, the response came, build a business case. At the time, we had an interim director of the whole school, and she didn't want to set up any liabilities for the future, so she took some persuading. Um, there were many committee hurdles to go through, and not all those committees are, is the library represented at, so we had to get our, our ducks in a row and get people to support us where it was necessary. But finally, we got to a special council meeting, that's the governing body of the whole LSE, in July 2012 and were given permission to put in a bid, the deadline for which was August. So summer holidays were out for most people. Then we had to build the case inside out. So we had to write a bid. Um, we knew that uh, we had some staff who could already write bids. After all, we live in a bidding culture. We are busy writing for money anyway, so I got all those people together who I knew could write things and gave them sections of the bid to work on. We began to engage our fundraisers, because again, this is not a free gift. That started rather slowly, but they're now definitely on board. They can see that, that things are really interesting in this area and we're all working hard in the same direction. 
LSE estates, I've already told you about, they were great and still are. Finance came right in behind us once we got council backing, and HR have been terrific in terms of supporting us for the transfer of staff. There are big legal uh, shenanigans you have to go through in the UK, which I won't bore you with, but these staff transfer with their existing terms and conditions to our employment, which is a very interesting situation for them and for us. The Friends of the Women's Library is a separate charity, um, and we had to obviously work with them and make sure they were on side with us. Um, we had to talk to prominent depositors, and some of those were a bit uh, wary of us. They weren't quite sure how we were going to deal with the collection. Um, we had to try to woo the people who were going to be judging our bid because this was a competitive situation. There were at one point seven institutions who were interested in taking this collection, all of them prominent institutions. Um, and while they would normally be our colleagues who we would chat to about it, in this situation we couldn't because we were in competition with them. Um, and we also had to be sure that any personal contacts we had with people who knew the collection or used it could be brought in to bear and could be quoted in the bid as they were. I had many long phone calls with very prominent women in the UK who'd been very busy in the fight for equal pay in the 70s and 80s, and I learned a terrific amount. Um, it was very helpful and they were very pleased to be part of the bid. So, eyes on the prize. We made uh, links with our own collections. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, who you may know of as a playwright, uh, was also a very keen amateur photographer. And we have his photographs and we have them digitized in our collection. You can find them online. Um, he was also a great supporter of the suffragettes unlike Sidney and Beatrice Webb, two of our other founders. Um, and here he's photographing a suffragette rally, and if you look carefully, you can see the banner for Fabian women, so that's presumably why he took that very one. We had to build a case outside um, to make the politics public about what we were doing. So we let our professional organizations know about what we were intending, we talked to the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, because we have an existing relationship with them. They funded some of our building and they funded a lot of the Women's Library building. Uh, we talked to the Arts Council who wouldn't normally uh, fund our kind of library except they run the designation system. But they are now funding us in the future and I may get time to come back to that so that's good. We talked to our National Archives and we talked to the Higher Education Council of England who had also put funding into the Women's Library. So, as I say, there were some competitors. We won't go into that. All of a sudden, our interim director stepped down and our new director came in from NYU. So I had to start all over again. This is going to be really great, Craig. This is going to be one of your first triumphs. This is going to be good. Um, we learned that we were successful in our bid in late September 2012. Uh, we were a little too tired to have a great celebration, though we did do something. Um, and we had a legal transfer from January 2013. But it wasn't all plain sailing. There were massive protests. Fundamentally protests against the collection moving out of the building. Um, but also protests against us. Um, a very big media campaign. Uh, lots on Twitter, lots in newspapers, an online campaign. Uh, many women's groups uh, spoke out against us. They were not very informed, but they spoke against us. Um, in the case of the local council for where the Women's Library uh, was hosted, the protesters got to them first before we did. That's the lesson to learn. Uh, members of Parliament were putting up what we call early day motions, so hoping that it would be discussed in Parliament. I don't think the early day motions worked, but it meant we had to write letters to every single MP who had signed the early day motion, and there were a lot of them, and a lot of them were women MPs. Uh, once they had our letter, they kind of understood what was going on, but it was a lot of extra work for us. Um, some depositors wrote and said, I'm taking my collections away, you're not a fit home for this. I'm, either they stay where they are, or I'm taking them away. I'm glad to say that most of those have revised that situation. Um, we had some researchers who were concerned about what would happen to the collection and how we would cope with it. 
um, and on the whole those people are okay, but they're not happy right now because the collection is closed. Um, and in terms of the protesters, some of them we did meet, some we didn't. Some demanded lots of meetings, some we wouldn't meet because we knew there was no actual meeting of minds. Um, and then the friends, and by that I mean the friends of the Women's Library, were and are helpful in terms of rebutting the things that protesters have said about us. We thought things were going fairly okay. So from January 2013, we were managing the collection uh, in its original building. So some of our staff and some of the existing staff. Um, but on International Women's Day, the whole building was occupied by the Occupy movement. I hadn't predicted that. <laughs> I predicted lots of things, but I had not predicted that. Foolish me. That was very difficult because we don't own the building. London Metropolitan owned the building, so they had to take the protesters to court. It was exceptionally difficult for the staff who did not know how to behave in that situation. And my conclusion was, while a protest is, is viable, the fact is it was incredibly disrespectful, both of, both of the collections and of the staff who were struggling to keep things going. So what about the collections? Keeping going. Patience is a virtue, I believe, but so is persistence with passion. We have had to be persistent about this. And this is a cigar box that belonged to Emily Wilding Davison. Some of you will know that 100 years ago yesterday, she stepped in front of the King's Horse at the Derby to protest votes for women. And if I get time, I'm going to say a little more about her in a minute. <clears throat> but her deeds, not words, and no surrender were our mottos. So, construction began <coughs> because we had space issues about bringing the collection into the library. Thank you. Um, and actually, it has turned out to be a very difficult situation. As those of you who've been through building works will know, every single bit of building work that we began hit a snag. And every single thing came in higher than cost. And we have halted construction over the summer. We've built the archive store so we can bring the collection to LSE, but the new reading room we planned has not yet happened, whereas we hoped it would. I'm going to uh, move on a little bit. You can see some of the things that are happening, including publishers are circling. Wouldn't you love us to do that? No. Actually, we have an interesting digital library and we'd like to work on it. So, what have we learned very quickly? We've learned that the Women's Library had a very high profile, higher than we imagined. And we learned that our collection had a very low profile, and that's astonishing. When we've had visitors come to see us, uh, and we've got out some of our things to show them, they say, great, you've already brought the Women's Library here. No, these are things we already had at LSE. So we've learned a very valuable lesson about not getting our own publicity out enough about what we already have. I think we were oversensitive to the protesters, but we have engaged our alumni and they put money up for the original construction, which is great. Our professional colleagues have been supportive. Um, we're doing lots of fundraising. Um, we've had to do lots of work with lawyers. I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't even carry in my suitcase the thick agreement that we had to come to. And you can see what we've been doing across the bottom here, constantly working on this project. Um, the staff as stakeholders are very important, and again, I'm going to zip through this, but I'm remarkably proud of my staff. Many of them have taken on roles I haven't even asked them. So one of them attended the weekly protest meetings and very bravely told the Save the Women's Library campaign, for such is their name, who she was and where she was from, which was very courageous of her. Um, and that has kept us on side in terms of their plans. They weren't part of the occupation and were caught off guard just as we were. So keeping staff on site has been really very important. There are some things that run directly through the collections, our collection and the Women's Library collection. And I'm just showing you here a piece of clothing from 1981. This was from the Greenham Common women's protest against American cruise missiles on British soil. Um, and you can see a ribbon hanging down from what we would now call a onesie. Uh, I remember wearing clothes like that. I am older than the Beinecke. Um, <laughs> and proud. Um, you can see the suffragette colours there, purple, green and white, and that's a really important thread. I'm going to talk a very little bit now to finish about Emily Wilding Davison because I've, I've allowed myself time to look at her papers and her artefacts 
and to come to respect her. In this picture, you can see her race card. Uh, you can see her return rail ticket from Epsom to London, which was used to try to prove that she wasn't intent on committing suicide. And you can see one of the two suffragette flags that she had wrapped around her body, so she was sure to be recognized as a suffragette. That flag on the right was actually taken by one of her friends, Mary Lee, and carried on the first campaign for nuclear disarmament um, march in England. So that's a really great thread. Uh, Emily was knocked unconscious by her collision with the king's horse um, and languished in hospital for four days. And she received a good deal of hate mail. If I can indulge your time, I'm going to read you one short piece of hate mail. Miss Davison, I'm glad to hear you're in hospital. I hope you suffer torture until you die, you idiot. I consider you are a person unworthy of existence in this world, considering what you have done. I should like the opportunity of starving and beating you to a pulp, you cat. I hope you live in torture a few years as an example to your confederation. Why don't your people find an asylum for you? Yours, an Englishman. Luckily, in a way, Emily was unconscious for the four days that she survived after uh, her accident. And we don't know what her intention really was, although you can see the films on YouTube and it was clearly that she intended to do something with the king's horse, possibly put the suffragette colours on that horse so that it would run over the finish line um, as part of a petition to the king. But what I want to do now is to read you a letter from her mother. This is dedicated to all of you in the audience who have feisty daughters, as I do. Um, her mother lived in the north of England. She was a widow, and she was clearly very worried. All she'd seen were newspaper reports. And this is her letter to Emily, which obviously Emily never read, but I like to think her friends read it to her. And it was written 100 years ago today. Dearest sweetheart, I feel I must write to you, although I'm in a terrible state of mind at the news which reached me last evening. I cannot think that you could have done such a dreadful act even for the cause, which I know you've given up your whole heart and soul to, and it has done so little for you in return. Now I can only hope and pray that God will mercifully restore you to life and health, and that there may be a better and brighter future before you. I would have gone to you if I could, but you will remember asking me never to leave home, no matter what should happen, as it would relieve your mind to know where I was. Today I had telegrams from Mrs. P. Gaskell and Mrs. Lee and Mrs. Green. They are all more favourable than the newspaper reports, and I trust the next may be better still. I need not tell you my heart is full of grief and agony, and the thought you are so far away is giving me much misery and pain. I know you would not willfully give me any unhappiness, although it must have been some sudden impulse and excitement. I want you to feel assured my earnest and devout prayers will be most in my mind until you are restored healthy again with oceans of love from your sorrowful mother. So, we haven't finished this project yet. We're still looking to the future. Uh, and this is a picture not taken by George Bernershaw uh, of a suffragette rally in Hyde Park probably in 1909. As you can see, they uh, welcomed inquiries, and we do too. Thank you.